So the title for this morning's message is, is Please One Another. And the text is Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. So let's read those verses so they're fresh in our mind. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things are written, were written before, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now as we start here in Romans chapter 15, we need to remember what Paul just said in Romans chapter 14. Right? Remember Paul began Romans 14 really introducing two types of Christians. There were those who were weaker in the faith, and, <clears throat> sorry, and those who were stronger in the faith. Right? And the weak wasn't due to strength or anything. It was because of just learning. They didn't know it as much. And they were learning. So he said the weak Christians were judging and criticizing the strong as being too liberal in their lives. And the strong Christians kind of despised and belittled the weak as being unlearned and naive. And the examples that Paul used were Dietary restriction and in holy days, right? An observance of holy days. But Paul knew that we as believers have different levels of understanding, right? We're all growing together. We're all on a different parts of the, the race, if you will, right? Or in different areas. And that we must, wherever we're at, be fully convinced in our own minds of what we believe. And then we're to do it. And if we're to do it, then he says, do it unto the Lord. So that's what he said, as long as you're practicing what you see fit and you do it serving the Lord, then it's nobody else's business. He says the truth is, though, that Jesus is our Lord. Right? And everything we should do, everything should be done unto him. And then he said in verses 10 through 12 in Romans 14, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God, shall confess to God. He says, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So he's saying, don't worry about what your brother's doing because you're going to have to give account for what you're doing. So then Paul goes on last week, as we looked at the text, that tells us to edify one another, right? Edify means to build up. He says, build each other up. And to do that, we need to know that we affect one another, right? We affect each other. So he says, don't judge your brother or don't put a stumbling block or cause the fall in his way. And then he says, don't grieve a brother or sister by using your liberty he says, but use your liberty in love. And then he said we had to have priorities. All right, he said the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And those are the things that we're to focus on. That's to be our priority. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because he says in verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So we got to have the right priorities. And he says, we got to help each other. Right? We got to pursue those things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. And we edify one another by helping each other. But then he says, you've got liberties, but you must not flaunt them. Right? He says, you're to exercise that liberty and joyfully before God 
and to do it from faith. But if it might cause a brother to stumble, then don't do it in front of them. And they also said, if you think something is not right, then don't do it, right? So that was what led us up to today. And really in today's text, Paul is kind of wrapping up this section on strong and and weak Christians. And really a section that regards Christian conduct. And he's telling us to please one another. So there's four areas I want to look at today. I want to see first a Christian exhortation, Christ's example, confirmation extended, and conduct exemplified. So Christian exhortation, Christ's example, confirmation extended, and conduct exemplified. So let's look at Christian exhortation, verses 1 and 2. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So we see first this exhortation. We then, he says, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not please ourselves. So he's saying if you consider yourself strong in comparison to your brother, he says use that strength then to serve your brother or your sister. Instead of using that strength just to please yourself, he says. See that word ought. Right? We who are strong ought. It has the meaning as as actually the ESV, the English Standard Version translates it. Basically, they translate it as you have an obligation to. And that's what it really means is to owe a debt. You have an obligation to bear with the scruples of the weak. So we have an obligation to bear with. And the idea of bearing with, the idea isn't just really bearing with or putting up with, but it's actually bearing up the weaker brother. The idea there is supporting him with your strength. The word used for for bear with could also be used in other places to translate drawing up a bucket out of water. So you're there to to bear up, to, to hold up with your strength, your brother, your sister. And I have the New King James, which says scruples. Right, bear with their scruples. I think some of your translations will say the failings of the weak or weaknesses. So basically help carry them more than tolerate. Right? It's not just tolerate. Help carry them. And how do we do that? Well, we get alongside. We have to be involved. But we don't do it by being critical or condescending. We do it by showing respect. by loving our neighbor as ourself. See, Paul says, we're not to please ourselves. You know what? This goes against the society of our times, isn't it? The society in our times, what does it tell people to do? Look out for who? Number one, right? Look out for you first. And it really, the society looks down on people who live their lives in real sacrifice and service to others. See, but Paul is pointing out that the way to true happiness and fulfillment in life is to get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off yourself. Start building up others. Start investing in others, and you'll find out at the same time you're being built up. You know, I think of when we are talking about the Haiti and stuff that's going on there and a few trips, you know. I always think when I go down there, the few times I've been there, man, I'm going to minister to them. I'm going to minister. Well, I do, but guess who gets more back? Me. See, by pouring ourselves out, taking our eyes off ourselves, it just builds us up too, doesn't it? See, that's what he's really trying to say. Let each of us then, he says in verse 2, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. See, this is simple if you read it, 
but it's challenging. It's challenging to put your neighbor first. It's challenging to think about somebody else's thoughts. But Paul says we must let each of us please his neighbor. And Paul kind of wrote and said pretty much the same thing in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. See, this doesn't mean, though, that the church is going to be ruled by the whim of whims of the weak. We're bending and we're, we're caving to them. But it means that we show a genuine concern for a weaker brother and sister. A genuine concern that will attempt to make them strong. We make them strong by leading them out of that weakness. Teaching. Helping. So that they then can be strong too. So he says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, for the neighbor's good. See, Paul Notice how he's saying, let each of us. You notice Paul here is being pretty inclusive. He's including everybody. Everybody in this. Each of us. See, even though you may be strong, here's a, here's a little uh, secret for you. There are still people stronger than you in the faith. Even though if you think you're strong, there's still people stronger. And you still need to be bared up and helped. Guess what? If you're weak, you may consider yourself weak, but there's still some that are weaker. And you can still help, and you can still minister there. See, we all have opportunities to help our brothers and sisters. We all have opportunities to help our neighbor. See, each of us can please our neighbor for their good. See, Paul is just in essence restating what he said back in chapter 14, verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Seek these things, right? Pursue them. Chase after them. It's for their good leading to edification. See, unfortunately, mankind, and including Christians, find it easier sometimes to tear down instead of build up. See, mankind has a way of tearing each other down instead of building up. See, it's the classic strategy of Satan. It's to get people to tear each other down. Don't let someone else be built up. But we're here to call to do good, leading to edification. See, Paul's exhortation to us Christians is to please one another. Find your way to Philippians chapter 2. So we just had a couple verses. I want to look at verses 2 through 5. So Paul says there, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, what does it mean to be like-minded? It means you think alike. You don't think exactly the same things, but you think alike. But that we have the same love. We're of one accord, of one mind. And that's when he says, let nothing be done then through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you Look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. So he tells us that, and then he goes in verse 5, he says, Let this mind, or this attitude, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that leads us now back to where we are in Romans chapter 15, verse 3. But if you're in Philippians, keep your finger there, because we're going to go back. See, Paul says, Christ is our example, in verse 3. He says, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. See, what Paul's doing here, he's quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. 
See, originally when David wrote this, he was writing about himself. But like so many of the Psalms, as we're studying on Wednesday nights, a little plug there, we're finding out David's writing about his life. But God is using it prophetically to talk about, as we call it, the ultimate David or the Messiah. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's taking and saying, well, David said it about himself, but really it's true about the ultimate David, the Messiah, the Christ. See, Jesus Christ was not self-pleasing. Right? For even Christ, he said, did not please himself. So Jesus then is the ultimate example of one who did not please himself, meaning he is not one that went to seek his own glory, to do what was on his mind, his own will. If you still have your finger in Romans chapter 2, because that's Paul's, Paul just builds that idea of, out, of how he thought of others and was not self-pleasing. Right Back in Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5 again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind of him? Look at verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So if you think about that, he was equal with God, right? We had the triune God. See, the glory of that equality with God that Christ enjoyed, he enjoyed it from eternity. But it was not something that he felt that he had to cling on to. See, Christ, if you think about it, he had all the rights, all the privileges of God, and he refused to selfishly cling to it to that exalted position as the Son of God, and he humbled himself. He was willing to set that aside, to come down to earth. Right? Look at verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So he made himself of no reputation, the form of a bondservant. Here you have the king of kings, God, he could have came back as a king, a mighty general, but he was born to a virgin, was married to a carpenter. Pretty uneventful. 30 years he lived on this earth. And then he had a ministry. And not that many people followed him in that ministry. but he made himself of no reputation. Why? Because it wasn't about him. And in verse 8, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So he, he was a man. And he humbled himself, those are the key words, he humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself, came down, and made himself subservient to God the Father. And he followed God the Father's plan, even to the point of death. And it wasn't just a regular death, it was a death on a cross. A death that was reserved for the worst of criminals, the lowest of humanity. But that's where we have our salvation. And because he did that, look at verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those on the earth and of those or in, the, in, in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, he humbled himself. He gave up that right. Because he was obedient, guess where he is now? Right back where he was before, ruling. And guess where he's going to stay? Right where he is, ruling. See, if you think about it, he, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, was willing to drink the cup of God's wrath. God's wrath for all of our sin, the punishment that we deserve for our sin, he was willing to drink that cup. 
right? Matthew 26, verse 39, it says, Jesus fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lord, if there's any other way, please. But you know what? If it's not, I am willing to follow your will. See, he willingly did it. See, he willingly suffered physical afflictions. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And he endured willingly emotional abuse and rejection. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was not guilty. He did not deserve that. He knew he was not guilty. But he knew it needed to be done. He knew we needed him to do that. So he did not please himself. But he always pleased the Father. Right? He humbled himself and became obedient. And he said in John chapter 8, verse 29, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. That please him. So he did it for the Father, but he did it for us. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. A little bit later, he says in verses 14 and 15 of John 10, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even as I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. See, for even Christ did not please himself. See, Paul is what's called here deliberately arguing from the higher to the lower. What that means is he's saying, in view of the greatness of what the Messiah was willing to suffer for us, how can we then possibly groan as we undergo a few voluntary restrictions of our liberty for the good of those who Christ died for? If he could do all of that, how can we groan about giving up a few liberties? to please our brothers. The scale's a little, little off there, right? But that's what he's doing. And he says, just as it is written. Again, Jesus fulfilled what was written in God's word. So Jesus shows us by example how to please others, how to take our eyes off of ourselves. And in verse 4 now, we see the, the confirmation extended. So he says in verse 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So he says, For whatever things were written. What is he talking about here? Scripture, right? Whatever's talking, that we, through the peace and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. See, the Scriptures the scriptures that have been preserved for us. Remember a few weeks ago, we studied 2 Peter. We looked at verses 19 through 21 of 2 Peter 1. And Peter said there, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right? And we talked about for us to really appreciate the value of God's Word and supporting 
our life as Christians, our faith, and the hope that we have, we have to remember how it originated. Right? Peter said, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Or different translations, like the way they render it, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Or no prophecy of Scripture ever came about by a prophet's own ideas. So he said it wasn't the man who wrote it. It wasn't his ideas. See, prophecy, it's not just prophecy foretelling. It's, it's telling, telling forth also the word of God. The whole Old Testament is what he's talking about here because that's what they had at that time. So he's saying all of that was written for our learning. And it's our learning because holy men of God we're moved by the Spirit to write it. See, the words of the Old Testament, just not the views and concepts of the authors, but the expression of a Spirit-inspired man, spokesman for God. I love that word moved. Remember what that meant? word move meant? It meant to be carried around like a ship that's getting carried by the wind. So the Holy Spirit is moving these men, to write these words. Just as it's moving Paul to write this letter to the Romans. See, Scripture is God's word. And it has to be held high. See, it has divine authority. It has the power of salvation. But Paul says here, it's written for our benefit, for our learning, if we choose to use it. <laughs> Remember 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And if you have an NIV, I love the way they translate it. All Scripture is what? God breathed. It's the very breath of God. The very breath of God if you think about the breath of God, what does the breath of God give? Life, doesn't it? How did Adam get his life? The very breath of God. All scripture is God breathed. It comes from the very breath of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, these four things that he mentions here, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. You know what that represents? It's just the daily pattern for the input and the output of the word in our lives as Christians. That's what it is. See, we, we're taught the word first, right? That's the first thing we do is we learn the word, and guess what the word forms? Doctrine. Some people don't like that word doctrine, but doctrine's a good thing because that's what you believe. It forms what you believe. And what we believe is that then the Bible becomes our standard. The Bible becomes our standard. And then now as Christians, we have a view of the world in light of that standard. That's called a biblical worldview, right? How we view the world. See, solely predicated on the standards and the truths found in God's word. See, then that word, as a standard, also becomes our filter, doesn't it? It becomes our filter. It helps us to reprove, to correct. Why? Because we have to fight off worldly teachings and influences that seek to counteract the word of God. We have to fight those off. How do we do that? We test them. I'm hearing this. Does it line up with this? No. Get rid of it. I thought this. The word's telling me this. Correct me, right? Reproof, correction. It's a cycle. We constantly need to shore up our doctrine, right? To know what we believe. To reproof and correct. See, that helps us replace our old nature and we then have Christ-like character. Then, we take what we've learned and what we are learning from the Word, 
and we, we live it out or we practice because we're not always perfect, but we're practicing, we're practicing, we're practicing. And if we miss the mark, we recorrect. And if we do that, Paul says, then we're instructed in all righteousness. And when we're instructed on all righteousness, we come to what he says in verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3. Then we can be a man or a woman of God, complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And if we're equipped for every good work, what is the, one of the good works that Paul's telling us to do here? Edify, right? He's telling us to please one another. Get your eyes off yourself. So he says, for whatever things were written before were written, for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Do you ever think of the scriptures as you go to them as one that, that offers patience and comfort? But think about it. That's what the word does. It gives us patience and comfort. See, we find comfort, consolation in the word. We develop patience from the word. We know how to handle tribulations in our lives. We know who's on the throne. And God's even told us how it ends, doesn't he? So we can have hope. See, we embrace hope then. So through the, the comfort and the patience of Scripture, we embrace hope. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So if you think about what the word does to us, right, that, re, that doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. As we go through things, we learn. As we look at the promises of God, we can hold on to them. And Paul says in verse 5 of Romans chapter 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we aren't going through this alone. If you're a brother and sister in Christ, you're not going through anything alone. You have God in you, the Holy Spirit. Praise God and amen. We're not going through anything. We have him with us. And so does a weaker brother, so does a stronger brother, but they have the same Holy Spirit. That's why he's trying to get to us bear with one another. So we close, as Paul's going to close now, kind of telling us what our conduct should be with a little bit of a prayer. I love it when Paul just kind of, some words right in the middle, is just a little prayer that he kind of offers up. Look at the con conduct to be exemplified in verses 5 and 6. He says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, to fulfill those exhortations that we saw in verses 1 and 2, we need what Scripture gives. We need the patience and comfort of the Scriptures. And Paul says, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you. See, the source of this patient endurance and comforting encouragement is obtained, that's obtained through scriptures is in fact of God. Because he is the God of patient endurance and encouragement, comfort. You think about the word and God. What did John say in his gospel, chapter one, verse one? In the beginning was what? The word. The word was with God and the word God, right? And then in verse 14, what does he tell us? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, the word, scripture, we have physical copies. 
Jesus, the Word incarnate. The Word carries the same characteristics of God that patience and comfort that he has are offered through his Word. And we know it through his Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. See, Paul is praying that God might grant them and us to be of the same mind, right? That we would be one with one another and we'd be enabling each other to bear with each other's weaknesses and, and really a demonstrate a unity that really results from a consideration that we have towards one another. And notice how it's to be. Verse 5, according to... Christ Jesus, or in accordance with Christ Jesus. So how Christ did and instructed. See, by following his example, by being like him, see, God is important, and he, he knows it's important for us to have the same mind towards others. Right? He doesn't want us to be pleasing ourselves and putting ourselves first. He wants us to Put others first. He doesn't want us to be mindless robots. That's not what it means to be of the same mind. It means to be of the same purpose. Marching toward the same goal. And what is that goal? That goal is that God may be glorified. Look at verse 6. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the hoped-for circumstance is that we might be of one mind and speak as one as we glorify God the Father. And I love that. And our Lord Jesus Christ, as we glorify them. See, Jesus himself, he put great emphasis on the need for us to have unity, a unity that him and the Father have, that we would be one like they are one, could turn to John chapter 13. We're going to look at a few things that Jesus had to say about us as his disciples. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, he put emphasis on us loving one another and having unity. Why? To make the world kind of wonder and be baffled. Right? How do these Christians love one another? Well, they love one another. Because of Christ, and they're following Christ's example. Turn to chapter 15, verse 12. He says there, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's pretty simple. You see how I loved? Go do the same. Now John 17. Jesus there is offering what we call his high priestly prayer on the night before he goes to the cross. And look at verses 20 through 23. So he's praying for his disciples that were gathered with him. And then he goes on in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone. So these that are with me now, I'm not praying for just them. But I'm also praying for those who will believe in me through their word. Here we are 2,000 years later. And guess what? That's who he's praying for, us. We have believed through their word. Their word. Those who believed in their word. And those who believed in their word, right? And those who believed in their word. And hopefully there's going to be those who believe in our word. And we continue to go. But he says, here's what I pray for them. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. See, he's saying that they're unified. 
and they're with us so that the world will know that God sent his only begotten son. In verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. See, Paul's prayer here at the end is mine too. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one, we may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is the result of making sacrifices. See, the aim of pleasing one another was so that we would concentrate on what was really important. What's really important is a united worship of God and showing the world the glory of God and the glory of Christ. And we do that by loving one another. Amen? Now that we get to stand now in a little bit after we pray, and we get to glorify God with one voice, with one mind, and let's do it loudly. Let's pray first. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for these words. I pray that we were encouraged by them and that we would continue to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love our brothers and sisters, to bear with them, to help them, to grow. Lord, and may the word continue to lead us. May your spirit make that word live in our hearts and teach us. May we be bright lights, Lord, that sing forth and then show your glory in this dark world. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.